Hi there. Welcome to my home um, and welcome to another Facebook Live. So, um, by the way, for the first few seconds, if you are watching this live, so only do this if you're watching this live, do let me know if you if there's any technical issues, because I like to know right in the beginning, is the orientation right? Am I upside down? Am I sideways? Um, can you hear me properly? Uh, is, the, is the volume too low, too high, anything? So I'd love to hear that in your comments and because that helps me. My wonderful husband, Danny, is behind the scenes and he's going to make adjustments if there's any issues that you're having. So he's going to give me the thumbs up if the comments are telling me that everything is going well. So. Today, um, oh my gosh, I have a whole bunch of things I want to share with you, but today I would also like to listen to your questions. I want to see if I can take more questions today. Yep, he's given me the wave and the thumbs up. Yep, you guys can see me, hear me. Wonderful. Thank you. So two weeks ago, I did a video. I mean, I've been doing one every week for the last few months, but the video I did two weeks ago has got the most feedback and emails that have come in about it than any other video I've done. And it's really interesting because it's making me realize that those of you who tune in and watch my videos and those of you who subscribe to my newsletter, and if you don't subscribe, please do. I'd love it if you did. Completely free, no strings attached. Um, it's making me realize that all of you who resonate with my work are so much like me. And so I feel I really, really know you. I really know you. So here's the thing. M you know, most of you know the story about my near-death experience. You know that I had cancer. I talk about how being a doormat and a people pleaser led me to completely becoming so drained and making myself so invisible that I eventually got cancer. And this led to my near-death experience. And after the, and during the near-death experience, the one thing that saved my life is realizing that I have a purpose here, that I matter, that I am loved, that I need to know this and I need to love myself. And for the first time while I was in that, which was while I was in that realm, and I'd never experienced this in my physical life, but for the first time, uh, and it was while I was in the coma, did I realize that actually it wasn't selfish to love myself and that my life matters as much as anyone else's and that we all are amazing and beautiful and powerful beings. We all have a purpose. We all have a reason to be here. And I had never known that. I had always made myself small so others could be big and I had always allowed myself to become downtrodden. And I say allowed myself, it's because, um, you know, I am not excusing childhood trauma or childhood abuse. That's not you allowing yourself. But as an adult, um, at some point, we do need to take responsibility for our lives. And for me, um, it took death. It really did took death and for me to come back to realize that I'm being given a second chance and I have to take responsibility for my life. But here's the thing. Many of you assume that just because I had an NDE and I came back, my life was hunky-dory immediately after that. That's not the case. And I'll tell you why. Because the world, the paradigm we live in, doesn't support what I learned on the other side. And that's because some of us, those of you tuning in, are unique. You're very unique. Um, and that's what I'm starting to realize. The more I do these videos, the more I talk to you, and the more I get your feedback, I'm starting to realize that there is a group of us or a category of us that's unique. We're not special or better than anyone else. In fact, if anything, I think that... Um, we, we seem to be carrying this burden for the world and I don't know where it, it came from or where it comes from, but we seem to be carrying this burden. But here's the trajectory of my life, which I believe led to this. Um, I have always been an empath and I know many of you listening in have as well. So now if you are an empath and then you combine this 
with spiritual teachings that teach you that you need to suppress your ego. You need to be of service. Now, here's what I want to tell you. What does it mean to be an empath? Um, when you are an empath, it means you can feel the feelings of everyone around you. It means you can feel the pain of the world around you. You feel it more than you feel your own pain. Now, for an empath, what they need to learn is they need to learn to, to strengthen their own inner resolve, their own inner love, the love they feel for themselves. But when, so, so an empath by default is already feeling everything that's on the outside, that, that the outside world is going through. They're already feeling everybody's pain. They're already feeling everybody's hurt. The thing about an empath, it's like a double-edged sword because an empath is also very connected to their other uh, side, their higher self. And what I call it is they're very connected to love. So if we call that higher self, that if we call God higher self, um, um, our spiritual self, our inner mystic, whatever you want to call it, just to simplify it, let's call it love. We are connected to that love energy as well as connected to the energy of the outer world. You get people who are totally connected to their, their love energy but disconnected from the outer world. Many, many spiritual beings, they disconnect from the outer world and they become hermits and they live in ashrams and, and up in the mountains. But empaths are people who have to straddle both worlds. This is what it means to me anyway. An empath is someone who is expected to integrate into this world, but has this deep connection with another world, which I shall call love, just to simplify it. So now imagine an empath who already, it comes naturally to feel for the people around them. It comes naturally to be of service. It comes naturally to give of themselves to everyone around them. If now all the teachings that they are absorbing, all the learnings are telling them that we must be of service, that it's selfish to love ourselves, that uh, to love ourselves means it's being egotistical. We must squash the ego. If the empath is then being told all these things, what then happens is that their own connection to their inner self, we start to doubt it because we feel it's selfish to recharge our batteries and to have needs and to have wants. It's our ego. And so what then happens is we start to focus on just serving the outer world. But an empath gets recharged by their inner world. So what I found though is that after having an NDE, I understood that I needed to get charged by my inner world, but I realized I didn't know how. I understood that I needed to love myself, which means to connect to love all the time. That's where my battery got charged from. I understood what I needed to do, but I didn't understand how. And I don't know if this is making sense to you. I'm going to ask you for your feedback in a minute. Do you relate to this? You know what you need to do, but you don't know how. And here's the reason why I didn't know how. It's because I had never done it in my life before. So for example, if you are to pick up a book of tools for people pleaser, doormats, whatever, it'll teach you how to confront others. It'll teach you how to, um, uh, how to be more of a fireball. It'll teach you how to set boundaries, boundaries, very important. It'll teach you all these things. But when you are an empath who's been a doormat your whole life, and I'm speaking for myself here, when I set boundaries, when I, and also books teach you that, um, about toxic energy and all these things, and you read these books, but inside there's always been something that doesn't feel quite right for me. It feel, I feel guilty. If I confront someone, if I block someone, um, if I do something that would be considered victorious in the toolbox 
of somebody who's trying to teach me how to stand up for myself and how to stop being a doormat. If I use those tools, I use them and I might feel victorious momentarily, but the next thing that comes in is guilt. It's like, oh my God, should I have been so confrontational with that person? How many of you relate to that? When you stand up for yourself, the next thing you, st you feel is drained for having stood up for yourself. You feel guilt for having stood up for yourself or for having been confrontation with the other person. Confrontation can be very, very difficult for people who are people pleasers, doormats, downtrodden empaths. Confrontation depletes you even though you know you need to, to, some, to be confrontational in order to stand up for yourself. So I started to realize that the tools that are developed uh, out there, the boundaries, the how to be confrontational and so on, were for people who were not so downtrodden, not so empathetic, who didn't have, who didn't spend a lifetime realizing that it's a virtue to be the way I was. And so I found that the tools didn't quite work. And so I had to develop my own tools. And one of the insights that I had was that up until this point, even after my NDE and trying to navigate the world as an empath and understanding that I'd been um, a people pleaser my whole, whole life, up until that point, I had been getting all my tools from the outside. I had been taking all my social cues from the outside. I had neglected my inner world. Now for an empath, they become a doormat because they neglect their inner world. So you cannot find your solution in the outer world. You will not find your solution in developing boundaries to the outer world. Your solution has to come from inside because the reason that you are in the predicament you are is because you have cut off your inner world and the reason that you have become a doormat is because you have stopped listening to your inner self because you don't trust your inner self. You second guess it. You think everybody else is right and you're wrong. You think what everyone else is telling you is right and you're wrong. You think that everyone else is more important than you. You think everyone else deserves love and not you. You're the first one to give yourself to everyone else, but you don't give yourself to yourself. You don't support yourself. And that is the reason you're in this predicament. So the answer to healing that predicament has to come from within yourself because it's following the outer world that got you into the mess in the first place. And I hope I'm making sense because I'm trying to be really as clear as I can. And so for an empath who has lived the life of a doormat their whole life, the first thing I would suggest is to learn to tune in to your inner world. And the way I do it is that I imagine that I can see the energy of love. Imagine if you can see it. Imagine if this sixth sense kicked in for you where you could physically see the energy of love within your own body, like around your heart. And if you could see it now, what would it look like? Would it be charged and vibrant and in whatever color you want it to be, red, violet, you know, indigo, whatever color you choose that's, that feels powerful for you. Would it be vibrant like that? Or would it be kind of shrunken and small and weak and maybe washed out? So I want you to have a think about that first. And this is the exercise I want to leave you with this week. So now I want you to not only imagine what that energy of love looks like within you, the second thing I want you to do during the course of this week is I want you to observe what expands that energy of love, what expands your heart and what shrinks it. And I really want you to be aware of it. When you are um, dealing with people who are confrontational, and it doesn't mean they're wrong, people are people, people are who they are, but does it drain you? Does it make your heart feel small? What do you need to do to make yourself charged again? Don't worry about what other people say. And this is our problem. 
We worry too much about what other people are saying, what other people are thinking. If you need to remove yourself from a situation to think, and here's the other thing about people who are empaths, many of you are not spontaneous. You can't come up with the right solution right away. You don't always have the most ideal reaction right away. Sometimes you need to walk away from a situation and then ask yourself, okay, what is the best thing I can do for me? So allow yourself to walk away from a situation. You can always say things to people like, let me have a think on that and come back to you. Um, I need to ponder on that. And is it okay if I don't make a decision right away? And is it okay if I get back to you? Come up with a bunch of answers that you can, that you can tell people that allows you the time to walk away and to see what does that do to you? What does going by that person's instructions, what is it doing to you inside? So, so the number one thing is to visualize that um, visualize love as something you can physically see. You can physically see the energy expand and retract around your heart area and your target, your aim is to do the things you need to do to get it to expand. So number two is to be aware of the things you're doing that are expanding it or retracting it. Start to become aware. Number three is to allow yourself to do the things to expand it without guilt, without feeling like you need to explain yourself because you don't, you don't need to explain yourself because here's what happens. If you don't allow yourself to expand love and you believe that it's selfish to love yourself and it's selfish to expand your love, what happens is that your love energy shrinks so much that you become dependent on other people to love you and you start to become a drain on other people's love energy. And if you start to become a drain on other people's love energy because you think it's too selfish to love yourself and you end up draining other people, which is more selfish? So loving yourself is the most unselfish thing you can do and you need to do what it takes for yourself and you need to take time out for yourself and I want to add the fourth thing here is that people who are doormats, people pleasers, they're terrible at receiving. They're very good at giving, they're terrible at receiving. So I want you to see yourself receiving and I want you to allow yourself to receive, receive abundance, receive the gifts of the universe, receive compliments, allow yourself to actually engage with only that which uplifts you. Because when you engage with that which uplifts you, you're actually able to engage with things that don't uplift you because you have the energy to do so. But you have to allow yourself to continue to receive love and to love yourself and do things that uplift you so that you can continue to be a force of help and service to those who truly and genuinely need you. So I'd love to go into your questions now. Um, do we have any questions? There's a very interesting question from Lisen. <clears throat> Lisen says, Anita, I have a question. Now that I love myself more than ever before, Yay! is it normal to feel that I'm no longer attracted to meeting new people? Yes. I feel I gave away so much of my energy before, I can no longer risk to waste any more. That is so healthy. It is so healthy to feel so complete within yourself. And I love that you're feeling that. It's so healthy to feel so complete in yourself that you don't need to meet new people. And that's the key word you said, you don't need to meet new people. When people who are off the same frequency as you, when you encounter them, It'll be so organic because neither of you will need anything from each other and it will be pure joy and pure pleasure to spend time together. And this is where I'm at. This is exactly where I'm at. And you know, the interesting thing is, as I said, when I came out of the NDE state, I knew exactly what I needed, where I needed to be, but 
it felt as though it was an uphill climb because it didn't feel like the world supported it. It didn't feel like our paradigm supported it. It's taken me a while, but it took me a while to get to a place like, wow. And when you get there, you actually feel that the world you're in does support it. And it's like, it's like the, the snowball that starts as a little snowball and rolls down the hill. And once it gathers momentum and once it gathers more snow, there's no stopping. And that's exactly how I feel now. And before I get into the next question, I also want to say another thing that people who are empaths, who are also doormats. So if you're a doormat, people pleaser, empath, another thing they struggle with is money. They really struggle with making money. And our paradigm doesn't support people who are doormats to make money. Um, so that's another thing that I want to tell you is that uh, you need to allow yourself to receive money with no guilt, because just like the love energy, you can only help other people when you allow yourself to receive money. And money is such a, um, supercharged, has such a supercharged energy in our paradigm. And we need to stop making it a taboo subject. We really do because it's not going, it's not going anywhere soon. You need money, not just to keep yourself comfortable, but in order to help other people. For me, one of the reasons that, um, that I feel I need money is because it gives me the freedom to do what I do. It gives me the freedom to make these videos for you. So I don't mind earning money for the things that I do, which do earn money. I don't force people to buy them or buy into them because I share my message for free. But there are certain things that do cost money, but I need them. I need them to pay the rent and I need them to support me to pay the people so that I can keep doing the thing that I love to do. Because what I actually love to do, which is sharing the message, which is communicating with people who are exactly like how I used to be, I love to do that. And I would, I have no choice because I do that. I do that in my sleep. I do that in the shower. I'm thinking of what to say next all the time. It's something I do. It's not a career. It's my calling. It's actually my calling. And the way that I look at it and how I would like you to look at it is if you are open to receiving, the universe will give you abundance in whatever way you need it. And I cannot make money for the sake of making money itself because that would defeat the point. It would de-energize me. It would stress me out. If I had to actually go to a job and make money to pay the bills, I would be deflated and depleted. And I really believe that if you follow your calling, the universe will support you. And so when I make money, I do it completely guilt free because I know that this is the universe's way of supporting me to do what I naturally do, which I would do even in my sleep. So that's a little bit I wanted to say about money. So let's go to another question. Laura asks, how can we all learn how to communicate with kindness and release the confrontational aspect of communication. Most of us haven't been taught to communicate with love from the inside. That's really interesting. And I love that question. I really love that question. Um, what I tend to do myself, and it might be a default. I don't, I don't know why I do this. I've always done this is that whenever I'm communicating, whenever I'm writing a letter, an email or communicating in my head, I always think in terms of um, how would I like to be told this? And on the one hand, I want to be totally honest because I don't want people um, living a lie or believing that I, I think one thing when I'm thinking another. So I think it's important to be honest because I feel that if somebody doesn't feel like doing something for me and they're unable to say no, um, and they do it just because they're unable to say no, I would much rather they said no than just do things for me because they can't say no. So I would much rather they would say no. But at the same time, in my own head, I'm thinking, I want to say no to this person, but I want to say no to them 
in a way that I would want to hear it if someone said it to me. So I reverse engineer it in my own head. It's like, how would I like to be told this? And that's how I tend to communicate with people. Um, and what, what's interesting in this though, for example, there are people though who actually don't mind being told things in a very blunt way with minimal words, or in fact, they like it. They want people to be to the point and tell them. And there are others who get offended uh, when they're told things bluntly. So it's a very interesting question and it's something I wanna ponder more about and talk about, but I do know that there are websites and books that, are, that do talk about um, non-confrontational communication. I forget what it's called. If I figure it out, I will put it in the, in the comments. But um, it is the fact that you ask this question actually tells me that you don't have an issue. That's the thing. It means that you are a very empathetic communicator and it tells me you don't have this issue. And you know, my assistant, Roz, who takes care of all my communication, one of the reasons I love her and one of the biggest reasons that she is my assistant and why I hired her is because her communication is so beautiful and so loving. And we get a lot of people that write in inviting me to do things, um, to be places, go here, be interviewed and so on. And I can't accept them all because there's just not enough time in the day. And also I want to make time to do my own thing. So she has to say no quite a lot. And she has mastered the art of saying no because she says it in such a beautiful way that I actually get people writing and or people at events who come up to me and say that oh my god your assistant she said no to me but she said it in such a loving and beautiful way it didn't even feel like a no so it is possible to do that and I also wish more people would have that skill it's so important especially in the climate we live in today so thank you you had numerous people commenting on how much they love your blouse. Yay! Okay. I loved this blouse and I love the colors because the colors remind me of, first of all, it's colorful, it's happy, it reminds me of a rainbow, but it also reminds me of the colors on my website and my logo. And it was just, uh, you know, it's like I saw this and I thought, oh, that's, those are the colors of my website and my logo. I have to have it. So, so there. <laughs> question from Lisa. Hi Lisa. Do you meditate daily? That's another question I love. So um, I'm going to say yes and no and I'll tell you why. Because I try and make my whole life a meditation. I feel that if I am living a life where I need to take time out to meditate, then that's not an ideal life. For me, my life has to be about feeling connected all the time. And this is what I mean about following your calling. I feel that I'm connecting with that space where I'm getting communication all the time, and that's my meditation. But I feel I spend a lot of my day disengaged from the noise of the world, and that is my meditation. So in other words, instead of taking time out to meditate, I'm doing the opposite. I'm taking a little bit of time every day to see what's happening in the outside world. So it's the opposite that I do. And I think that's a more ideal way to live. And I think that if everybody did it, we would have a very different world and we would actually create an outside world which we don't need to disengage from. So thank you for that question. <laughs> I think we only have time for two more questions. Okay. There's a question from Anna. Yes. How can someone get rid of guilt? Guilt is a huge one and it took me a long time to get rid of it. And really when you think about, um, so for me, things like journaling, writing about it, talking about it to you is very cathartic. So if you were to write about it and write about it very honestly, who you are, where you are, um, and actually, let me backtrack. Number one thing with feeling guilt, if you're feeling guilt uh, for whatever reason, the number one thing is to accept. Accept where you are right now, who you are right now, and be honest at least with yourself. That is the number one thing. Be honest with yourself. It's like, 
I did this and I feel guilty, but I am going to accept myself. Number two, make a commitment that you are going to love yourself through this. You are going to love yourself through this. Number three, laugh at yourself. I do that a lot. My husband and I have actually become really good at laughing at ourselves. We laugh at each other, we laugh at ourselves, and we try to desensitize these things about ourselves. You know, this thing about me being a people pleaser and a doormat. And he has Asperger's. And um, I talk about it freely and he talks about it freely. And if you wanna see what Asperger's looks like, uh, watch the video of us cooking in the kitchen and watch how focused he is. So Asperger's is an ability to um, really be really highly focused that you forget that anybody else exists. And empath, on the other hand, are people that are so aware of everybody else that they forget that they exist. So it's almost like an opposite problem, although he is also very empathic, but his Asperger's just makes him so highly focused that sometimes he's not even aware of what else is going on in the room. So watch that video to see him in action doing that. And so again, with guilt uh, or anything like that, the first thing is acceptance. The second thing is loving yourself wherever you, you are. It's like, I did this, I feel really guilty about it, but I'm gonna accept this is who I am. It's not a flaw, it's part of my gifts. It's part of my gifts of being super sensitive, super empathetic, because you know, if, um, if we suppress our sensitivity, if we suppress our empathy, this world is gonna be even more messed up than it already is. So thank you for that. One more question, did you say? One more question, unfortunately I cannot pronounce properly the writer's name i believe it's pronounced q ridwin um who says speaking of empaths how can you explain to someone not yet fully aware that you are an empath and that is why you sort of shut off sometimes and just merely observe the energy around the situation so if people don't quite understand that you can always say that you're an introvert or that you you are actually super sensitive and try to explain it to them in whatever language uh, that they understand the easiest is actually to say that you're shy and introverted i often say that to people um you know and it's funny because I speak to you guys on video all the time. And yet, do you know that from the time I was a kid, I've always been shy. And sometimes I can't believe where I am and where my life is right now for somebody who was a shy, introverted, doormat empath. So um, the first thing is accepting it within yourself and, um, and then actually, telling people that you're shy. But here's another thing that helps. If you laugh about it, if you say, you know, I have this stupid affliction, I'm just super shy or I'm super introverted, just excuse me for it, it's not personal. Oh, that's it, it's not personal. So people wanna know that they haven't done anything to offend you and it's not because of them you're doing that. So make that clear to people. It's not personal, it's not you, it's me. I'm quirky, I'm the weird one, you know, I'm the quirky one. I, so, and this is what my husband and I do to each other all the time. We each tell each other, yeah, this is one of, my, um, one of my quirks, it's one of my quirks. So we take responsibility for being that way. I take responsibility for being an empath, for, for being quirky, and he takes responsibility for having Asperger's. That makes it so much easier. Um, writing about it, I find also makes it really easier to get clarity on it. So um, thank you all so much for being here, for tuning in, for your questions. Um, please put comments below, whether you're watching this on YouTube or you're watching this on Facebook. I would love to hear your comments and your feedback. I would love it if you clicked like, um, I would, and, and I would love to see you again next week. And of course, if you're at any of my events, check out my events. I would love to see you in person and give you a hug. Thank you all. I love you all. Have a great week and I'll see you all next week. Bye.